All right. Everybody set? Mics and all that good? Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much for joining us, and uh, uh, very pleased to be joined by my colleagues, our Deputy Secretary of Transportation, Polly Trottenberg, our uh, FAA Administrator, Mike Whitaker, who have uh, done so much to push our department's request forward and work uh, through everything associated with the President's fiscal year 25 budget uh, uh, as regards their areas of responsibility. And I, I want to thank our budget team, led by Victoria Wassmer, uh, who is here in case a question more difficult than I can answer comes up. Uh, but thanks really to the whole team for, for all of the hard work uh, that, that you all have done to get us to today. Uh, this is a budget that is going to matter for uh, so many areas of uh, American transportation, including our aviation system, where we're going to be proposing some bold steps for the future to ensure that we preserve America's extraordinary safety record. Uh, but first, I want to refer back to what America heard from President Biden on Thursday. This country has come out of one of its hardest moments in a century with unique strength, uh, whether you measure it in historical terms or whether you measure it in comparison to nations around the world, from uh, fighting inflation back down to the level it is at today, to modernizing our infrastructure, to lowering the cost of prescription drugs. It's been an extraordinarily uh, effective few years for the Biden-Harris administration. Inflation is down more than half from its peak. Wages are rising faster than prices. Unemployment has been below 4% for more than two years. That hasn't happened since before I was born. And while I am young to be doing the job I'm doing, I'm not that young, uh, it's an extraordinary thing uh, that it has been that long. Uh, and under President Biden right now, we are seeing some of the lowest black and Hispanic unemployment rates in recorded history. In areas closest to what we do here at the DOT, we have made tremendous project uh, progress through the president's bipartisan infrastructure law. About 46,000 projects uh, and counting are now moving forward, and they're improving infrastructure and transportation in communities of all sizes. Roadway fatalities are at last beginning to come down from their peaks. We have a lot of work to do on that front. Shipping costs are down as supply chains are running more smoothly, and airline cancellations last year were measured at some of the lowest levels in a decade. We know there's a lot more work to do from here. We are rebuilding not just from the consequences of the pandemic, but from decades of disinvestment, rising inequality, and a regulatory environment that has for too long privileged the interests of corporations over those of the American people. So the President's budget that we're proud to present today protects and builds on the progress we've made and enables us to deliver on the important challenges and opportunities that remain across every mode of transportation. Our USDOT budget request of $146.2 billion would allow us to continue advancing work on a number of areas, and I'd like to highlight just a few. The budget includes $16.8 billion for the Federal Transit Administration to support urban and rural transit service, including $2.4 billion for major capital projects through the Capital Investment Grant Program, or CIG. For example, it provides $350 million to extend the red line in Chicago to the far south side, including uh, the community of Roseland, which stays in my mind because uh, I noticed when we visited there as residents from that part of South Chicago were describing how long it takes them to get to the loop, the downtown area where most of the jobs are, uh, that residents of the neighborhood of Roseland in the city limits of Chicago take about an hour and a half to get downtown, which is the same as the community of Roseland, Indiana, which is 90 miles away, if you do have a car. Uh, but we're fixing that. And it's estimated that over 13,000 people a day will be boarding the L at these newly created stops and be able to benefit from more of the economic opportunity in their city. So just one example of the life-changing potential of the CIG program that's getting robust funding in this request. The budget also includes vital resources to increase rail safety and to improve passenger rail. It includes $2.5 billion for Amtrak, increasing the number of safety inspectors to a record 400 inspectors, and adding new staff to complete safety audits. Uh, you're now going to hear more detail from our Deputy Secretary, Polly Trottenberg, on how this budget is going to improve hundreds of thousands of miles of road and strengthen America's ports. Uh, then our FAA Administrator will cover some of the critical aviation work supported by this budget. Uh, and then uh, I'll come back for uh, one more thing that we'd like to announce. So with that, let me turn it over, Polly, to you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am looking forward to providing some additional information about key programs in the President's budget. I, too, want to thank Victoria Wassmer and her budget team. And on the FAA side, Mark House, Dave Rickard, and the whole team over there, a lot of great work went into the proposals we're discussing today. Uh, as the Secretary mentioned, we are continuing our administration's robust investments in roads and bridges for a total of $62 billion, so people and goods can move safely and efficiently in every corner of the country. Thanks to President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law, we're tackling major projects like the Calcasieu Bridge in Louisiana, Martin Luther King Bridge in Philadelphia, where the Secretary will be tomorrow, and I-70 in Colorado. And this budget will allow us to continue that momentum. As you all know, roadway safety is a priority for this department, this, this Secretary and for me. We are still seeing too many fatalities and serious injuries on American roadways, devastating families and communities across the country. This budget proposes $3.2 billion for the Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP. It empowers states to create data-driven, strategic, and performance-based safety programs targeted to their needs. A companion program that's funded through advance appropriations at $1 billion is the Safe Streets and Roads for All program. That program is unique in that it is dollars that go to local communities in companionship to states to develop comprehensive data-driven data safety plans, and deliver roadway improvements that benefit all users, those who drive, bike, walk, and roll. This program, again, it's fairly unique in allowing cities, counties, small towns, and tribal areas to access federal funds directly. And it's spurring creative and innovative approaches to roadway safety and, and creating a community of practice to share best ideas. The President's budget also includes some additional safety investments of nearly $350 million in railway highway crossings, wildlife crossings, and tribal transportation set aside. We also remain focused on the cost of goods that people see at the store. And we know that supply chains have an impact on that. The President's budget includes $530 million for the Port Infrastructure Development Program to fund in improvements in ports to move goods more quickly, to create jobs and economic opportunities, enhance safety and resiliency, and improve air quality in nearby communities. Lastly, I want to tee up some really exciting news that Administrator Whitaker will give more detail on. I got to see firsthand in my time as acting administrator last year the FAA's urgent need for more robust capital investments to modernize the air traffic control facilities, radar systems, and IT systems that are essential to running one of the nation's most complex 24-7 safety critical operations. So we're very proud that for the first time, the President's budget includes a mandatory appropriation of $1 billion for fiscal year 25 and $8 billion over five years. This proposal envisions a more stable, predictable, and long-term budgetary commitment, which will allow for the better planning of multi-year capital projects, as is done under the Companion Airports Program. So with that, I'm pleased to hand it off to Administrator Whitaker to share more details. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Secretary and Deputy Se Secretary Trottenberg. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss President Biden's fiscal year 2025 budget and what it means for operations in our national airspace and for the safety of the flying public. The President is requesting $20.8 billion to operate and modernize the national airspace system, including $3.6 billion for our facilities and equipment, almost $3.4 billion for airports, and $250 million for research. The request also includes a new proposal that would dedicate another $1 billion toward our capital needs. Combined with the $5 billion under the bipartisan infrastructure law, the FAA fiscal year 2025 funding request totals $26.8 billion. The passage of this budget will help us in three of our key priority areas. We can continue to increase hiring of air traffic controllers. We can continue to modernize the air traffic facilities, many of which are beyond their useful life. And we can add safety oversight resources. With respect to controllers, we need more air traffic controllers, and we're hiring as many as we can. The budget request will allow the FAA to accelerate controller hiring and training. Hiring and onboarding more controllers is essential to meet increasing traffic volume while safely integrating new users to the NAS. Last year, we surpassed our 1,500 controller hiring goal. This fiscal year, we expect to exceed our target of 1,800 new controllers. And for fiscal year 2025, we will hire even more 
at least 2,000 air traffic controllers. Speaking of controllers, next month we open the hiring window to onboard a new class of controllers for our academy in Oklahoma City. As FAA's chief recruitment officer, I need everyone to spread the word. Uh, and since it's Women's History Month, I think it serves as a timely reminder that we need to do more to recruit underrepresented communities into our workforce. Less than 17% of our controller workforce are women, and that's unacceptable. We must do better. Our air traffic control facilities are aging. The FAA owns more than 350 air traffic control facilities, and they're all old. The average age of an air traffic control tower is 40 years. The fiscal year 25 budget builds on the bipartisan infrastructure legislation by proposing $8 billion for a five-year facility and radar modernization program, beginning with $1 billion in fiscal year 25. That will facilitate the replacement of air traffic control facilities and radar systems, all of which are critical to maintaining safe operation in the NAS. These infrastructure investments are vital as we build the NAS of the future. Aviation safety, which will always remain our first mission at FAA, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX 9 incident of January 5th is a reminder of the enormity of FAA's safety mission and our commitment to uphold the highest standards of quality in conducting safety oversight. Following the incident, the FAA took immediate action to increase its oversight activities, and we will continue to put safety first. As the FAA's oversight work continues, we look forward to working with stakeholders and Congress to ensure the FAA has the resources that it needs. The fiscal year 25 budget proposes $1.8 billion for the Office of Aviation Safety to provide critical support for production oversight and continued operational safety. These are some of the highlights of a proposed FAA budget that is robust and necessary to advance the agency's progress toward ensuring the safety and efficiency of our national airspace. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Um, as you've heard, so many exciting things included in this budget that are going to make a, uh, an important and positive difference in our ability to meet the mission of the Department of Transportation. Um, I want to highlight one other piece of good news. We are working to close a glaring loophole in our aviation system, uh, something that affects Americans every time they buy an airline ticket. Our budget proposes that the small percentage of people from around the globe who choose to travel by private jet start paying their fair share into the system. The fact is we have one national airspace that integrates many users to move seamlessly guided by thousands of FAA's highly trained air traffic controllers, but that system is not paid for in fair and equitable terms. Business jets account for more than 7% of flights handled by the FAA, but contribute just 0.6% of the taxes that make up the airport and airway trust fund. Regular airline passengers pay a passenger facility charge of up to $4.50 plus a 7.5% tax on the prices of their tickets. So passenger taxes increase as the cost of a ticket increases. Meanwhile, private jet flyers only pay fuel surcharge taxes, roughly 22 cents per gallon of jet fuel. What that means is an unfair share of the burden falls to regular air passengers who are not on private jets. And that's something we believe must end. So the president's budget proposes to close this loophole. We would increase kerosene jet fuel fees on private jets, which would generate approximately $1.1 billion in additional revenue over five years that would be used to help make the national airspace safer and more efficient for every American, for every user. We're talking about who pays for those highly skilled and highly trained air traffic controllers and those complex navigation systems, the critical people and equipment that make safe, efficient air travel possible for millions of people every day. To put it plainly, the president wants to close the loophole for private and business jet flights and require them to pay their fair share to fund the FAA's safe operation of the national airspace. This would update the fund structure for the first time in decades so that the regular flying public is no longer, longer uh, in effect, subsidizing the wealthiest Americans who travel in private and business jets. And this is even more important given the growth of the global fleet of private jets over the past two decades. 
all in the time since the fund requirements were last updated. To be clear, closing this loophole will specifically affect private and business jets, not the small planes used for farming or uh, small business surveying with a small prop aircraft or for medical evacuations or uh, for uh, hobbyists or for people in, uh, in the kind of training that helps people get their flight hours. Uh, this is about making sure that those users in business and private jets are uh, paying something closer to their fair share. So we urge Congress to join the president to make the use of our airspace fairer and safer by closing that funding loophole for private jets. And with that, we'll be open to questions. Uh, quarterback by Sean from our press team. Hi, Chris. Just saying, please see the news. By, if I can just get the Boeing questions out of the way first. Um, you know, we, we learned recently the DOJ investigation, criminal investigation into Boeing and then this weekend that Boeing doesn't appear to have records around removing a door panel during manufacturing. It raises, again, a question if you can't trust Boeing to install bolts or document that they installed the bolts, how do you trust that they're building anything safe? I'll toss to Mike in a moment to share more from the FAA perspective. Obviously, we respect the independence of uh, DOJ and NTSB doing their own work, but uh, we're not neutral on the question of whether Boeing should fully cooperate with any entity, NTSB, us, or DOJ, and they should, and we expect them to. Uh, I would also say the administrator's leadership has been really critical to making clear to Boeing that they need to uh, go through a serious transformation here. Uh, in terms of their responsiveness, their culture, and their quality issues. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to the administrator to share a little more about how he's approaching this. Thank you. I, I guess I would just add, as you know, we, we've increased our audit and our oversight of Boeing pretty significantly since January 5th. If we see something that requires us to, to cease production or pull something down, we'll do that. Uh, but we're continuing that oversight, and we're working with Boeing and uh, demanding that they come up with a very detailed plan within the next 90 days uh, to fix the quality issues that are out there. And, and while that work is going on, we will continue to increase our oversight to make sure the planes that are getting their airworthiness certificates are safe airplanes. Is not having the paperwork on we took a door off and put it back on not enough of a red flag to take additional action? I mean, that well, seems like a fairly glaring mess up. Right, and that, that's part of the NTSB investigation. As part of I, our investigation, we've done a issued a letter of investigation over the incident. Uh, it is one of the factors that we're considering as we formulate a plan to get the quality assurance where it needs to be. There should be paperwork for that. Great. Other questions? Oh, uh, Dave Shepherdson from Reuters. First, staying on Boeing for a second, I want to ask about this incident in Australia involving a 787 Dreamliner in, what, in which 50 people were injured. Do you have any concerns? Are you investigating that? We're looking to the broader issue. Uh, we will certainly work with the Australian authorities or the New Zealand authorities to investigate that and the Chilean authorities. It's obviously not a U.S. Uh, flight, but it is in the 787. So we will we will certainly follow that closely. So, and, and just to follow up on Chris's question about the, the audit, right? So did you find paperwork of other removals of door plugs that Boeing did over the last few years? Is there any indication this is a one-off, that the paperwork was only missing here? And, and can you talk about the milestones you expect Boeing to meet in order to allow them to resume production increases at some point in the future? So we're working closely with NTSB on looking at the paperwork from the from their work. So I'm not going to comment on the state of that investigation. Uh, at the, the, in the next 30 days, we hope to have the milestones defined uh, with Boeing. That's the first order of business over the next 90 days to agree on what the milestones are and then start monitoring those. Do you feel like they're making safe airplanes right now? Uh, we're certifying the airplanes as they come off, and, and right now with our oversight, we're certifying them as safe, yes. Because okay, respectfully, you certified this plane that didn't have bolts in a door panel. So right, to reassure the flying public that, in fact, the planes are safe. We've dramatically increased our oversight of the actual production of the aircraft. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Mr. Secretary, I um, wanted to uh, see if you could revisit your comments about Congress's inaction about the uh, the Rail Safety Act, yeah. you know, being a year after the derailment in East Palestine, and and I have a follow up. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have views on this. As you know, they haven't changed. Congress should act now. They should have act yet, acted yesterday, and uh, the next best time to yesterday is today. Uh, we continue to have cases, incidents where there are 
uh, derailments or other accidents. And we know that tougher oversight and regulation would make a difference. To be clear, we're not waiting on Congress. Uh, we have focused inspections, additional audits, FRA activity, looking over the shoulders of railroads to make them safer and to make sure that they're meeting their legal requirements. But the legal requirements could and should be tougher. Uh, the last time I checked, uh, every major Class I freight railroad over the last year uh, saw their accident rate unchanged or actually get worse, with the notable exception of Norfolk Southern, uh, which had a, uh, a dramatic decrease in their mainline accident rate, which I think is likely related to them responding to the pressure that they have been put under. But it shouldn't take an incident like in East Palestine for there to be that kind of reduction. All of freight railroading should go through that kind of safety improvement. Uh, and while they should do that on their own, we're not waiting for them to do it. Congress needs to do its part, too. They are out of excuses. Um, the only excuse I've heard left is some in Congress say we have to wait for the NTSB's final report before they will act. I disagree. But if that's the case, that final report's coming out in June. Uh, so now would be a good time for them to be locked and loaded for when the report does land. And specific to the fiscal 2025 uh, budget request, an obvious question, but what is your level of optimism on its reception on Capitol Hill? And, you know, are you even optimistic that they're going to meet the September 30th fiscal deadline? Obviously, that's been a struggle for this Congress. But I'll, I'll say this. I, I would like to believe that the priorities that were laid out, the infrastructure gains that the Deputy Secretary walked through, the aviation safety improvements and enhancements that the Administrator walked through, uh, a measure like making sure that private jets pay their fair share into the system, uh, or any of the infrastructure priorities that, uh, that we are talking about and asking to be funded in this budget, uh, including hiring more air traffic controllers, ought to be a bipartisan priority. I certainly would expect any member of Congress on either side of the aisle who has expressed concern about something like air traffic control staffing or uh, the sustainability uh, financially of, of how we pay for the national uh, aviation system or uh, railway safety would, so to speak, put their money where their mouth is and support these measures. Um, Katie Cummings with CBS News. Last week was a bad week for the airlines. What do you have to say to the flying public? Is the system safe? What I'll tell you is every time I get, every time I step off a jet bridge and onto an airliner, which is every few days, uh, I know that the reason why American aviation is the safest means of travel in the world is the work that is done by the FAA, by flight crews, by everybody who is involved in that process. And it's the result of an attitude that doesn't just wait for a fatal incident to happen and respond, but even responds to close calls with the intensity that America used to reserve for responding to a fatal incident. Uh, and that's true whether we're talking about the design of the aircraft, whether the aircraft was manufactured the way it was supposed to be designed, or whether the aircraft was maintained the way that it ought to be manufactured. There continue to be cases, uh, major ones, that get our attention. Uh, and while they are rare, and the last year's worth of NTSB data that we have suggests that they were uh, actually a bit lower than they had been in previous years, uh, you don't want to see any of those happen at all. Uh, I only wish that we could take the level of concern and rigor that we have for aviation safety and start applying it to roadway safety, uh, where the number of Americans that we lose on a daily basis is roughly equivalent to the number of passengers aboard a fully loaded 737. And just a quick question. Simply put, what does this budget mean to keeping air traffic safe? It's going to help keep air traffic safe by hiring and equipping the FAA professionals who do that. Oriana. Oriana with Politico. Um, on the budget, the multi-year mandatory account, is the goal to pay for the account with the taxes that are being collected by the private jet users and the fuel tax hike? Or how would this work? As you mentioned, mandatory. I'm trying to see what mandatory means in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, let me tell you in my unsophisticated way why I think it's a big deal, and then I'll toss to Mike to share a little bit more about how that trust fund is used. First of all, uh, of course, as I mentioned, we're talking about $1.1 $1 .1 billion to be raised from the private jet provision. We're asking for $8 billion into this mandatory account. So obviously that's only uh, part of, of the picture. But what I would stress is this. Uh, the national, uh, the, the, the NAS and the systems that support it are one of the most complex civilian operations in the whole federal government. And there are a number of systems that need to be modernized or even overhauled. 
no private sector organization would undertake a multi-billion dollar IT overhaul plan without knowing more than one year at a time what its funding was going to be. Uh, that would be considered madness. And yet, here for one of the most expensive and complex operations in the United States, uh, we are expected under the current structure to fund these massive capital operations with year-to-year -year uncertainty about what that funding is even going to be. So the idea of having some of this uh, funding be mandatory is that it would create the requisite certainty that is needed in the FAA uh, to better plan and prepare these kinds of overhauls. But again, that's my high-level view. Let me ask Mike to share a little more about the sources and uses of those funds. And I'm going to phone a friend and ask Deputy Secretary Polly, uh, Polly Trottenberg to help me with this a little because she really started this work when she was uh, acting administrator. But I want to sort of really hit home on the point that, that, that our facilities are really old. And I mentioned the towers. We talked about radars. We have 21 centers that control high-altitude traffic. They were designed to be have a life of 50 years. They're all 60 years old now. So that, that all that work has to be done to replace those. It's a huge undertaking. So this is really a big step in trying to get some of that funding. But, Paul, do you want to talk about that? I'll, I'll just I'll add one point. I think the, the Secretary put it so well. But just, I think, an observation for me coming over to the FAA and having had experience with transportation agencies at the state and local level, New York City DOT and the MTA, transportation agencies that have major capital assets, and the FAA has one of the largest collection of capital assets in the federal government, the towers, the radars, all the equipment, typically have 10-year capital budgets, where, again, they know what their capital dollars look like, and they can plan for long-term projects. As the Secretary says, we don't have that for the FAA facilities and equipment. Interestingly enough, we have it in, for the airports program. We also have it, by the way, in uh, what's called um, contract authority on the highway side. So we have versions of it in other parts of the federal budget, but not for, frankly, the capital investment that needs to happen in what is one of the major sets of capital assets of the federal government. So this is, this is going to start that process of giving the FAA the certainty they need to do those long-term investments. Great. This will be our last question. And Greg, do you want to take it? Thank you. Greg Wallace from CNN. I think for the administrator, um, you talked a bit about the, uh, the Boeing audit. Um, and when you released the update last week, it didn't say specifically what had been found. Um, could you share some specifics about what deficiencies you found and what you're looking for in that 90-day plan, please? What we're really focused on is the, the quality assurance process and where the, where the gaps are in that process. Uh, so uh, we, we've communicated that to, to Boeing. Uh, it focuses on uh, having the, the employees have the right tools and the right training, uh, having the right uh, engineering drawings and in the, in, in assembling the aircraft in the proper order, not traveling work. So uh, things, that, um, things that just findings from the floor in, in that process. Taking that with the findings from the culture survey that was done uh, after AXA, um, and a lot of work that's been done directly by Boeing getting feedback from their employees and baking all of that into uh, a, a plan to fix the production system over the, that plan being put together in the next 90 days. Does that mean most of what you identified was paperwork issues, or were you seeing unsafe or unsatisfactory practices? It wasn't, it wasn't just paperwork issues. It, sometimes it's order that work is done. Sometimes it's tool management. It's, it sounds kind of pedestrian, but it's really important in a factory that you have a way of tracking your tools effectively so that you have the right tool and that you know you didn't leave it behind. So it's, it's really uh, plant floor hygiene, if you will, uh, and, and uh, a variety of issues of that nature. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks all so much. Uh, we'll have some of our budget folks on hand to answer any other specific questions about the budget, uh, but Secretary, Administrator, and Deputy Secretary. Thank you. Thank you.